Thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Happy Friday. All right, it started very early on. It started just two months in. Uh, specifically, it started two months and one day into the new administration. A person named Ellen Moran stepped down. Who is Ellen Moran? Uh, you probably don't know now, and honestly, nobody knew then either. <laughs> she was very low profile, but she had an, Im an important job and a very impressive job title. She was the White House communications director. Now, she was not the spokesperson at the podium, so she wasn't like on TV every day doing the briefing. She was the person behind the scenes working on communication strategy overall. And she quit April 21st, 2009. Word from the White House was, quote, it wasn't a good fit. It did seem to be an amicable departure. Uh, she left the White House, but what she did was she just moved over to the Commerce Department instead, where she became chief of staff there and served happily for years. But she was the first, Ellen Moran. She became the first high-profile departure of the Obama administration. Started, they made from, from day one, from January 20th, and he was sworn in, they made it two months and one day to April 21st. Three months and one day, sorry. Right? January, February, March, April. Sorry, three months in one day. And you know, nobody's saying that first terms are easy, uh, particularly when it's a president who hasn't run anything at the federal level before, right? There's definitely a learning curve, and you gotta figure out if you got the right people around you, and there's gonna be some turnover. And so with the brand new Obama administration, that one-term U.S. senator, right, coming in to be president for the first time, of course, Ellen Moran wasn't the, the only White House official who turned out not to be a good fit at the start of that administration. The following month, there was uh, the director of the White House military office. He resigned after he approved a dumb photo op uh, this is the photo, where Air Force One flew really too close to the Statue of Liberty, and people got nervous in New York when they saw it. So he left uh, a month after the White House communications director. Then three months later, in July, it was the top advisor on the auto bailout who left. Uh, and then the month after that, in August, it was the Obama administration's um, advisor on cybersecurity who resigned. Uh, then in September... Uh, it was Van Jones. Van Jones is very well known now because he's a CNN guy now, but uh, he was less well known then as an advisor to President Obama on green jobs. And in September, he resigned too. So if you were looking for signs of a, a brand new administration having trouble finding its feet, maybe even an administration in turmoil, that's what you had in terms of major departures from the Obama administration in the first 252 days. When the Obama administration was as old as the Trump administration is today, they really had had their fair share of departures, high profile departures from the new administration. That White House military office, a short lived communications director, a couple of advisors, they were all out. Well, we are now 252 days into the Trump administration. Let's see how they're stacking up on this same scale. You ready? So in the same time period when those were the major departures from the Obama administration, the Trump administration, we couldn't even keep them all the same size. We do not mean to intend, imply that any of these smaller heads are less important than the larger heads. It's just a, it's tough to squeeze them in. Uh, the Trump administration has been here for uh, 252 days and so far the Trump administration has lost or fired, are you ready? The Acting Attorney General, the National Security Advisor, the Deputy White House Chief of Staff, the Director of the FBI, the Deputy National Security Advisor, their first White House Communications Director, that's Mike Dubke there, uh, the Vice President's Chief of Staff, that's Pitcock, whose name is under Dubke, um, the Chief of Staff of the National Security Council, the Director of the Office of Government Ethics, the White House Press Secretary, Sean Spicer, uh, the Assistant White House Press Secretary, the White House Chief of Staff, another White House Communications Director, that would be Mr. Scaramucci, uh, the Senior Director for Intelligence at the National Security Council, the White House Chief Strategist, that was Steve Bannon, uh, also the Special Advisor to the President on Regulatory Reform. They also lost a high-profile Deputy Assistant to the President who nobody really knew what he did. Remember Sebastian Gorka? Yeah, I, we don't know what he did. But he was a uh, Deputy Assistant to the President. Uh, we also lost the Vice President's Press Secretary and uh, now today the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Everything okay, you guys? Sorry, we couldn't keep all your heads the same size. 
I mean, I realize Barack Obama, new president, losing his green jobs advisor <laughs> in the first year. I mean, that was something that was of grave concern to like Fox News for not just weeks, but months. But the, what's happened at the Trump administration, this is an order of magnitude different. We've never seen anything like this. This latest departure tonight from the Trump administration is notable because it's a cabinet secretary, Tom Price, right? A cabinet secretary having to resign in a big corruption scandal. Uh, and it's notable because it really is the latest in a tremendous flood of major departures from this very young administration, right? In this short amount of time. But you know, it's also notable because you really could see this one coming inexorably. This time last night, I said we were on resignation watch when it came to Tom Price. That turned out to be right. Uh, but you could also see it coming a long time ago. You could see it coming from the minute he got nominated to the cabinet. Tom Price was dogged from the beginning by a scandal from his time in Congress, where he enthusiastically bought and traded healthcare companies' stock, while at the same time he was taking actions on the health committee that he ran that affected the price of those stocks that he owned. At his confirmation hearing, Tom Price was questioned about the fact that some of those trades he did in health companies were VIP deals, where only he and a few other select clients were even allowed to trade those stocks at those prices. Hey, Mr. Chairman of the Health Subcommittee, how'd you get those special deals? Tom Price, when questioned about that in his confirmation hearing, he just denied that he'd been in on any VIP stock deals. He said, oh no, the public could have been in on any of those deals, which absolutely was not true. He was under oath at the time, and he never went back and corrected those statements. But the Republicans on the committee and in the Senate at large were happy to vote for Tom Price anyway. And you know what? It turns out when somebody during their confirmation process shows a proclivity for self-dealing in government employment, and when they're more than happy to lie about that and not even bother to clean it up once they're caught lying on it, even under oath, when somebody shows you that's who they are, as they say, believe them. If that's what you paid for in a cabinet secretary, that is what you will get as a cabinet secretary. But thanks to investigative reporting from Rachna Pradhan and Dan Diamond at Politico, Health Secretary Tom Price will not go down in history as the health secretary who tried to take away health insurance coverage from tens of millions of Americans. He will go down in history as the second casualty from the Trump administration related to direct and serious allegations of corruption. They made it 252 days and only lost two people to corruption scandals. Uh, the first was Carl Icahn, who left his regulatory advisor position under a cloud of allegations about how he appeared to have used that position for his own enrichment. For Tom Price, the proximate cause of his resignation is the embarrassment over his extensive and enthusiastic private jet travel, which was all charged to taxpayers. As Pradhan and Diamond published scoop after scoop about Tom Price's million dollar plus luxury private aviation, including hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of flights he took with his wife on military aircraft that cost taxpayers up to $25,000 an hour. After those scoops mounted at Politico.com over the last 10 days, ultimately the White House got dragged into it too. The president himself started telling reporters he was bothered by what he'd heard about Tom Price on these flights. Then the White House press secretary took care to say yesterday that the White House had had no role in approving any of Tom Price's private flights. But then at 7 o'clock last night, there was yet another scoop about more than a half million dollars in military flights for Tom Price and his family that the White House did, in fact, approve. Which makes it harder for this to get written off as some case where the president was very upset to hear about this terrible, wasteful behavior by Tom Price. Given that his White House approved it, that will be harder to get away with, or at least it should be. So Trump's health secretary is out now, which means maybe the focus will shift to Trump's EPA director, who's not only got the same private jet travel fetish as Tom Price, he's also lined himself up an 18-man, 24-hour-a-day security detail. And bizarrely, he is having the EPA pay to build a secure, soundproof phone booth in his office which apparently is costing taxpayers about $25,000. Now, his agency first tried to say that his magic soundproof room was a security necessity. It's a skiff 
They tried to say this is just the EPA building itself a sensitive compartmented information facility so in employees can handle super top secret EPA materials. But it turns out the EPA already has a skiff, already built, already exists on a separate floor. What they're building for Scott Pruitt is, is just what the, what the contract calls a privacy booth for the administrator. A privacy booth in, in which he will presumably be safeguarded by his 18 bodyguards and to which he will be flown on one of several private jets. If it's not EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt who gets the attention next, it may instead turn to Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, who, it turns out, doesn't always use a horse for his commute. Sometimes Ryan Zinke has taxpayers pay for a private jet flight, uh, private jet flight on an aircraft owned by an executive from an oil and gas exploration company in Wyoming. While, as Interior Secretary, he's always, uh, also moving to, to give away more federally controlled public land for oil and gas exploration. That one private jet flight the taxpayers paid for on the oil and gas executive's plane, that one started in Las Vegas, where uh, Secretary Zinke had been giving a motivational speech to a hockey team owned by his biggest campaign donor. That's where the trip started. It ended at Ryan Zinke's house in Montana. And taxpayers paid for that to be a private jet flight on an oil executive's plane. Secretary Zinke has also charged taxpayers to pay for his private jet flights to Republican fundraisers. And then there were the multiple private jet flights he charged to taxpayers for flights to and around the U.S. Virgin Islands. And, you know, to be fair, that's the kind of one where you think, okay, that one may make sense, right? We all know how hard hit the U.S. Virgin Islands were by the hurricanes, but actually, no, in this case, Trump's interior secretary, Ryan Zinke, charged taxpayers for private jet flights to and from and around the Virgin Islands in March, way before the hurricanes, when everything was fine. In fact, what he did there was go on a snorkeling tour, which the taxpayers paid to fly him to on a chartered private jet. And with Ryan Zinke, again, could have seen this coming. Senators apparently decided they did not mind that official report on him from his time in the Navy when he got in big trouble in the Navy because he, according to the Navy, had fiddled his expenses in order to get the government to pay for his personal travel. Ahem. I mean, if you decide you don't care about ethics issues like that when you nominate people to things, <laughs> you get headlines like this once those people are in office. You get behavior like this. And, and you can just keep going on this same theme. This really is a very deep deep theme in this new administration. There's also Trump's Treasury Secretary, who now famously requested a $25,000 an hour military flight for his European honeymoon. He didn't get it. He did have to settle for flying his new bride on a military jet that expensive to Kentucky, to Fort Knox, where the publication Coin World reports the happy couple inspected the gold. But there's more. There's also Trump's Veterans Affairs chief and his wife, who taxpayers apparently just paid to send on a 10-day European vacation, sorry, work trip that included a championship tennis match at Wimbledon. And I do mean championship. It was the women's final. We're talking Serena Williams. Um, the trip also included a tour of Westminster Abbey and a river cruise down the Thames and a canal tour in Copenhagen where they saw the Little Mermaid statue and trips to four separate palaces. In the middle of this trip, Trump's VA secretary reportedly had four straight days with no daytime business whatsoever on the calendar. They were very efficient, though. Clearly, he and his wife made the most of it. Four palaces is a lot. Washington Post points out tonight that Secretary Shulkin took this whole taxpayer-funded shebang less than two weeks after he signed a memo for other staff at the VA telling them to please review their planned travel to determine if it was really truly necessary. Quote, I expect this will result in decreased employee travel and generate savings with the department. Signs Secretary Shulkin. So he signs that and then on his way out the door, bye, gotta go. I, I'm, I've got, I'm going to four different palaces to see Serena Williams. I'm going to Wimbledon. Now you guys get these travel costs under control. I gotta go. My wife's waiting. 
So Trump's health secretary is gone as of tonight. His VA secretary, his interior secretary, his treasury secretary, and his EPA administrator all appear to have done pretty much the exact same stuff as the health secretary. So I guess theoretically, if the administration is going to say that Tom Price's behavior was a problem, we should be watching to see if those other four officials from the Trump cabinet are going to go now too. To encourage you not to hold your breath on that, after Tom Price resigned today, the president chose to display his personal disapproval of Tom Price's terrible taxpayer-funded conspicuous waste by himself flying on Air Force One to his golf resort in New Jersey. Today, as the White House absorbed a second day of blunt headlines about their tax plan and its expected effect, which would be to shovel lots more money to the richest people in the country and to corporations. Today, as one of the multiple Trump cabinet members caught up in a private jet greed and corruption scandal finally had to resign. Today, the ninth day of a legitimate crisis continued to unfold for the three and a half million Americans who are the victims of a terrible storm that hit more than a week ago now but who continue to be victims of what thus far has been a botched and dramatically inadequate federal response. The president over the past few days has been insisting like a bizarre fantasy mantra that everything's going great in Puerto Rico. And our team has been incredible. We have had tremendous reviews from government officials. We are doing a great job. Everybody has said it's amazing the job that we've done in Puerto Rico. We're very proud of it. As far as Puerto Rico is concerned, that's been going, as you know, really well. I think it's going really well. We've made tremendous strides. It's been incredible, the results that we've had. People can't believe how successful that has been. We have done an incredible job. We've done a really good job. I'm there to help, I can tell you that. This is an island surrounded by water, big water, ocean water. We will not rest, however, until the people of Puerto Rico are safe. After saying today that he would not rest until the people of Puerto Rico are safe, then right after that is when the president flew to his golf resort, which is where he is right now. Presumably he is not resting, though. Uh, we're going to be live from Puerto Rico with the mayor of San Juan. Stay with us. Sorry. I need to make a correction from the top of the show. It's Friday. There was one whole night this week when I like, didn't get any sleep because my back hurt. And then I got like the knock on effect where you're not really tired the next day, but you're tired the day after. Sorry. So that's my excuse. Here's what I screwed up. I said at the top of the show that when the Veterans Affairs Chief went to Wimbledon this year, Serena Williams was playing in the women's final. Here's what I have to correct. Uh, the Veterans Affairs Chief and his wife did take a taxpayer-funded 10-day European trip that did include trips to four different palaces and a tour of Westminster Abbey and a river cruise and a canal cruise and four straight days with no scheduled events in the middle of their European vacation, I mean work trip. And the Veterans Secretary did, on this taxpayer-funded trip with his wife to Europe, he did go to Wimbledon where he did see a championship match and it was the ladies' final. And it was one of the Williams sisters in the final, but it wasn't Serena, it was Venus. And I need to watch more tennis, clearly. My mistake, my apologies, very sorry. We'll be right back. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you wanna keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.